Hey, and welcome back to a new video. Today, I'm going to share with you some tips when you're working with the sequencer, when you're creating your cinematics. So let's get started. The first tip is when you create your sequence shots like this, you have one shot, two shot, three shot, is that you can create a level sequence and then you can bring all these level sequences and place them inside that level sequence. Now, if you try to simply click and drag and add it like this, they will be on top of each other. And for some reason in 5.4, and I don't know about 5.5, but it might be the same. You cannot move these up and down if you drag them like this. So what you can do is simply add just one, like so, then move your playhead wherever you want, or just keep it in the same location, it really doesn't matter. But when we click and drag these, these will be added after the playhead. That's why we add it after. So I'm gonna add it here for now, just to demonstrate. Click on these two, press on Alt Shift and place them here. They will be placed next to each other. And now you can move them up and down. So that's the first tip is that you can add multiple sequences to one sequence and you can place them like this to play the animation like this. Now, why would you do that? Well, there are many, many reasons you might want to do that. I have the following, I have shots around this object and this object, so I can simply select these objects and I can add them to my sequencer like so. Click on the add menu to add to sequencer, so add current selection, or you can click and drag from the word outliner and add them like this. While things are selected, it might be a good idea to right click and move to a folder, new folder, and this will place everything for you in one folder. And instead of creating a new folder, then selecting the elements and move them to a folder. So that also works. So let's say these are static meshes. You can name that and now our sequencer is organized. Now I'm going to select all these and I'm going to click on the track transform so now they all have the transform track and i'm going to add or click on enter while they are all selected to add a keyframe and instead of clicking on these keyframes one by one so that's one way where we can add keyframes now these keyframes they are in their correct location they are also in nice place so place this wherever you want and now i will show you some cool trick you can do let's go to the first frame like so let's select one of these objects and then let's move it up and move it like so and if you have auto keyframe i call it or create a key when channel or property change this will create an animation for you so when we click on enter this will add keyframes for the location rotation and scale you can play with all of them so i'm going to rotate this a little bit like so and maybe rotate it like this and maybe we can either set the scale to zero if you feel like it. So now, of course, if you play this, this will play in funny way. Or you can keep the scale. So now I added the scale zero on the X, that's funny. So let's <laughs> add it on the Y and the Z as well. And now the animation will play nicer, as you can see. And since we have multiple sequences, the animation will keep playing. So if I select this and move it like so, it can start from here so we can add some randomization. So now this is one item we animated. Let's say these two items here we want to animate as well. So we can select both, move them to the top. It will add keyframes for both. And let's move this one to the left or to the right. This one to the left. Don't forget to rotate like this. And you can rotate even more for more rotation. And now when the animation plays, they will go to their location. And of course, if you set their value, the scale to zero, that will look cool as well since we set that item here before them to zero as well. So select both, click here to go to the first keyframe, click on transform, click and set the scale here to zero, zero and zero on the X, Y and Z. And the same for our other mesh. So expand transform and set this to zero, zero and zero. And we can click and move the keys around so they can they won't start in the same time this will add some nice randomization to our animation so this will go first and then this will go after and instead of like them being placed both at the exact same time which is cool if you want that but some randomization also will be also cool so we can do the same for this book we can since we have the book and the animation the key is set where with like the final state we want now i can let's say go to this view and i want it to come from the right to the left so i can click on the y and i can click here and i can move my camera outside and i can rotate it like this and move it even away a little on the tab 
let's say, and let's see if we play the animation, how this will happen. This will be nice. Here I have a keyframe by mistake, so I can remove that. And I think I should have moved them away. So that's on me. And here is another tip. If you don't want to change your view, you can hold control, right click, this will move on the Y axis, left click, this will move on the X axis, as you can see. And if you hold control and click on left and right mouse buttons, this will move on the Z axis. So now if I click on play the animation, they will all come now. So obviously the book should come before them, so we can do that before them. And if you want to start from here, you can like do this, then move these like so. This will add the book, this item, this item, and this, and yeah. So you get the idea. Let's say you want to play a little bit with the animation even more. I want for this to be bigger and get smaller. For example, you can click on the key, you can click on the curve, and let's go back to where we have our scales, select these three like this, then select one of these points and move it like this. And now notice how this will be bigger and it will get smaller. Maybe we need to exaggerate it even more. So let's do this. And now it will be big and small. So yeah, having fun with the animations is very cool. So just have fun and you'll be surprised how many cool results you can get. Now, you can also change the keyframe interpolations with the shortcuts on your keyboard. I can press on one, so it will start slow and it will become faster and it will maintain its speed. Sometimes you want that, sometimes no, you want the animation to be linear. So the shortcut for this is this, one, two, three, four, and five. So if I select these and set them to one, so here this will go slow, fast, and it will slow down again so you can easily change this if you right click and set this to linear. The animation now will play with one consistent speed. And if you don't want to right click and select it, then you can press one, two, three, four, and five. So if this is set on the default value of this, then you can select all of them and press on four to switch these to linear keyframes. Now, every time you create an animation, so let's say I want to move my camera, so let's pilot the camera and move this. By default, you may have the cubic interpolation. So if you don't want this, you can click on this button and you can set the default key interpolation on creation to be the key interpolation you want. So let me show you. If I click and I create a duplicate of my keyframe, so that's another tip, you can click on the level sequence, make a duplicate, open that level sequence, delete all the keyframes inside it, and now you have a complete new canvas to animate things inside, like so. Now there is no animation, so I can click on transform. See, the new keyframes are set to cubic interpolation. So if I don't want that, I always want to linear animation because maybe I'm animating so many cameras. You can click here and click on linear. And now when I click, it will add linear keys for me. I can set this where I want and I can move this, let's say here, and I can move it and then I can do this and it will add linear keyframes for me. And that's what it is. Hey, quick pause. If you want to create interactive architectural experiences so clients and stakeholders can explore and interact with your projects, I've designed a step-by-step -step training program that will help you master Blueprint and make your projects fully interactive. If you want to learn more, check out the link in the description. Now, let's go back to our lesson. Now, another tip I have, Maybe you want some controls, maybe you want for animation to be longer. So you can click on this and make it longer and then struggle a little bit here. Or you can click on perspective, go to the cinematic viewport. And let's say I want the animation to be 210 frames. I can click 210 and that's it. Then I can click on this and expand it. Or you can click on a specific keyframe like this go to properties and set the time on that to 210, but then you need to do it on the other. And what about this? Can we do it on the end? No, you cannot do it. So click on both keyframes, right click properties and set both to 210, and that will make expanding the animation better. One other benefit of the cinematic viewport is the overlays. Sometimes you want to center things exactly where they need to be on the screen. You can click here on the overlay and you can have grid, you can add crosshair, you can also add safe action, title safe, custom safe, 
change this to whatever you want so you can have focus where you want to focus if you want to do that. So the composition overlays are very, very useful. I use grid a lot when I want to focus things on this part of the grid, this part of the grid. It just helps more with the composition and making the pictures look nice. So let's say you're happy. You can turn these off if you want and keep this on or off. Now, another tip I have is the ability to hide actors. Notice how here, these actors here, these frames of the doors are hidden. But when I close my sequencer, they will go back. This is very useful when you have a camera in a place like this, and then you zoom like this, but there is something in front of you. So if you want to hide actors, you can simply add these actors to your sequence, like so. so here I have a folder called static meshes, and I have the actors that I want to hide like this. So we can add any actor, let's say this, click, add it here, and then find that actor that you've added there. And that actor is here. Click on the track and click on actor hidden in game. And here you can set this to false. And of course you can animate this. So you can set it to false, true, and it will have one state, true and false. So when this is false, now it's true, it will appear. So this is very useful, as I said, for many scenarios. And one of them is some objects that are blocking our view, like what we see here. Now, that's a tip I have. Another tip I have is the ability to change time of day. So let me create a quick sequence and let me find a nice view of our project from the outside. So I'm going to go outside, touch some grass. Let's say this is a nice view here, okay? And I'm going to move this like this and I will just move my camera and I will set this to be five seconds and I will set this to be five seconds only and click on play. It's looking nice. Of course, don't forget to set your focus to very high value so we see everything clearly. Or if you have your actor to be like this, this is a spawnable actor, you can set the focus method from manual to disable in this scenario. And I will elaborate more on this. This is very important if you're using possessable or spawnable cameras. This will spawn with every sequence we add, but possessable, that means this here, right now, look at this. This is icon here, the thunder icon. If it's on, it means this is spawnable. It means if I close the sequencer, this actor will disappear. We will not see it anymore. But if I open the sequencer again, we will see that actor. Now, let's say I like this view. I like it a lot. And now I want to change the time of day. If you have the sun and sky, this is one of the best ways to change the time of day because it's actually accurate. You can set the latitude, longitude, the time zone, all these things. And then all you need to animate is the solar time. So click and drag, add it here. Then click on track, add the solar time from here. Or if you don't want, or if you don't know where the element you want to animate loca is located, or even if it's animatable, you can look in the details panel. If you see this icon, it means this value can be animated. If you don't see it, for example, the latitude and longitude and the time zone, we cannot animate these, but we can animate the solar time. So click on the solar time, and let's say we want to start from seven in the morning, and we want to animate to nine in the morning. Like, let's make it really small, because if you animate it too much, it will be really too much. So now you can see the sun is being animated, like so. If you want really fast sun, then be my guest. Let's set it 9 p.m., which is 21. So click on play. You will see this is going a whole day, as you can see. So maybe, maybe you want a longer animation or something. So that's how you animate the time of day, with the sun and sky. And if you don't have the sun and sky, go to edit and go to plugins and here search for sun position calculator. Enable this, restart your engine and you should find that under lights, sun and sky, add it, add the latitude, longitude, all these settings and then you can animate the solar time. Easy peasy. Now, let's say you've animated, you've created some level sequences and now you are ready to render your sequences. Here are some tips. So go to window the to open the movie render queue and here let's say you added the first sequence or you've added your sequences so let's find these and let's add all of them like so you don't want to set them manually like this that will take too long especially if you have too many sequences what you can do add just one sequence set it 
to a value you like. So let's say 4K final. And once you're happy, click on all the other sequences and add them and they will retain the same settings you have. Otherwise, you need to, you know, change them manually. And I've done that in the past. So I hope now I can save you some time when you do this. So just set the setting you want to set and then click and drag and they will all have the same settings. Now this brings me to my other important tip. You don't want if the engine crashes or maybe some every day you want to render some work in progress shots to add them every single time and set the settings here. So you can save the render queue. Here it says unsaved queue. Click save queue and let's say delete me so I can delete that. And now every time I want to load this queue, all I need to do is to load that queue. So let's say now I don't have anything and I close this and let's open the, I restarted the engine or I want to render this again. I have multiple queues, open the movie render queue and click here. So this will tell me, hey, you've changed on this and loading this will do some changes. Click on yes, it's okay. And this will load the render queue for me. And you can guess if you have many queues, this will make your life so much easier when you want to do renders. Maybe you want to render just the interiors, maybe just the exteriors, maybe just the night shots, maybe 1080p, maybe draft, maybe 4K, whatever it is, you can save all your queues. And that also brings me to my next important thing. When you set your settings, so here you can see that I have my 1080p draft settings with the date, the sequence name. So this is very important. The file name format, you can use these versioning settings here and you can copy or take some of the settings that we see here, the date, the time, whatever, and place them here. So now every time I render, this will start my sequence with a date, then a sequence name, then a frame number, and then any other settings I have. And for me, that's very important because I do my best to keep things organized. So the date is very important for work in progress shots, for example. I want to know when this work in progress have been done or whatever. So that's one. Number two, when you set up your settings, you, you set your whatever, burn in, camera, color output, the name of the file, the location of the file, all these things, you can also save these presets. So you can, if I do any changes, so let's say I want to do this, now I can save this on top of my current preset, or I can save this as a new preset. So save as a preset, and somewhere I have a folder called presets, I can go to that folder, so here we are the presets, cinematics, console variables, whatever. Stay organized, please. You can save your preset, and then when you go here, you can always load your preset. So if I want Lumen 4K draft, I have the 4K draft. If I want 4K final, I have 4K final, EXR, blah, 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 and so on. So save your presets and save your cues. This will save you so much time. All right, I hope you found this lesson useful. If I want you to take anything from this lesson, that floating animations like this are very cool. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. I hope you enjoyed the tips. If you want to support us, check out my Blueprint course in the description because when you click on play and you bring the taskbar like this, so I can change the time of day like so. I can change my view mode to a third person mode like so. I can bring customizable interface like so to change things around. So if you want to learn how to make your Unreal Engine projects interactive, check out the description. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. Take care.